A reading from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, 24, 25, and 35 through 41. And going along, Jesus saw a person blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man himself, or his parents that made him born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be shown in it. I have to perform what I was sent here to perform while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spat upon the ground, made mud from the spit, and anointed the man's, blind man's eyes with the mud. Then he said to the blind man, Off with you now, and wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means having been sent. So he went away from there and washed, and when he came out of the water, seeing. Then his neighbors and those who had seen him before because he was a beggar said, Wasn't this the man the, uh, who sat and begged? Others were saying, Yes, he is the one. No, but he looks like him. It is me. How were your eyes opened? A man called Jesus made mud, and he anointed my eyes. And he said to me, Off with you, go to Salome and wash. So I went, and I washed, and I have new sight. Where is that man? I don't know. Later, some Pharisees called the man who used to be blind and said to him, You give glory to God. We know that the man who cured you is a sinner. Whether he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind. Now I see. The religious leaders threw him out. Jesus heard they had thrown him out. When Jesus found him, he said, Do you entrust your life to the Son of Man? And who is this, sir, that I may entrust my life to him? You have also seen him. It's the one that you're speaking with. I believe, Lord. I have come into this world in judgment that those not seen may see, and those seen may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things, and they said, We are not blind, are we? If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now you say, we see. Your sin remains. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Good morning. It's a great day to be in this house of worship. I know there are many other places you could have been today. But I am praying that God will speak to your hearts and give you a blessing uh, that you can receive and take with you this week. This morning I'm continuing in our sermon series that's entitled Falling Upward. And it is uh, addressing this topic that when we fall, God is there to raise us up. It is through our own sin and failures that we actually come to experience the grace of God in our lives. Today's scripture reading that we heard is all about Jesus healing a man who was born blind. And this is one of my favorite scriptural texts. Uh, John is unusual in that this is the only story that is told about a man who is blind being given a sight. In all the other Gospels, there are plenty of examples of Jesus healing and teaching. He says, I have come into the world, this is my purpose, that I am to proclaim good news of release to the captive, to give sight to the blind, and to heal those who are lame. This story is rather long, it's 41 verses. We didn't read all of them. But in this story, the, the plot line is rather complex and it's got all kinds of characters in it. Of course, you've, you've got Jesus and the disciples and the blind man, his friends and neighbors, and also the Pharisees. And the end, of the story has a surprising twist that those who thought 
they could see are really blind, and those who know that they're blind can see. Will you bow your heads as we pray? Oh God, we ask that you would open our eyes and our ears to see and hear the truth of your gospel, that when we fall, your grace is ever abundant. Bring us to the light of your truth. For this we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. One time someone asked me, what is the best advice that you could give to the parents of teenagers? And I knew immediately what I was going to say. For the love of God, never teach your children driver's education. <laughs> Spend the money, send them to driver's school, Take a second job if you have to, mortgage your house, but don't teach your kids how to drive. And, and I learned this the hard way through, you know, the school of hard, hard knocks. And uh, my first two daughters, they went to driver's education school, you know, they loved it. They came out, they knew how to drive, they still had to practice for a while, as we all know. But when my third one, you know, came along, it was time for her to get her learner's permit, I thought to myself, you know, I can do this. I've got 25 years of driving experience, and, uh, you know, this could be one of those times where uh, it could be that uh, daddy-daughter time where we could really bond together, you know, have these shared experiences where you can make memories. And we did. <laughs> I have long since gave up saving for my children's college educations. I simply save for their psychotherapy. <laughs> but I went to the, to the mall and I bought the curriculum and you know we set out to to teach and she had to read some things and I had to instruct her and let her drive around and um, you know what happens don't you what was intended to be a great experience ends up with frustration anger and lots of tears and that was just for me Well, one of the things that really impressed me was teaching the child how to look for things that are in their blind spots. And so they had an exercise where you were to take an object about two and a half feet tall, about the size of a toddler, and you would put this object behind the car. I took the kitchen trash can. And I first started out setting it about five feet behind the car. And when uh, I told Becca, when you see it, let me know. At five feet, she couldn't see it. At 10 feet, she still couldn't see it. I moved it to 15 and then 20. And because she was rather short, at 25 feet, is where she at last saw that trash can. And I asked her to step out of the car, to walk to the back of the car, and to see exactly how far back she could not see. Now we're all aware that there are blind spots in any vehicle, and the longer the vehicle, the farther back the blind spot goes. Even though we're told to check our mirrors, uh, to take a look over our shoulders, to make sure there's not something there, sometimes we miss it. And I've found that in newer cars, especially in SUVs, they have lots of blind spots. You know, it's because they want to make them sexy and attractive, but they're not quite so safe. And what they've done to compensate is we have this technology where we have backup cameras, 
Some cars even have cameras on the side, and we have sensors that will alert us. They will light up and beep if we're turning into a lane where there's another car, or if we're backing up in a parking lot space. Uh, and there's a car or a person coming, it'll, it'll beep. I, I, I was driving a, um, oh, what do they call that? A Suburban. It was a big car. I'd never driven a Suburban before, didn't have any experience. And I was backing up and a car was coming. And those of you who have one, you know what I'm talking about. The seat began to vibrate violently. <laughs> and it scared me to death. But I actually kind of enjoyed it, too. <laughs> and the whole purpose was to make me aware of a threat or a danger or of an object that I could not see. When Jesus is in the temple with his disciples, they come across this man, probably a beggar, who had been stationed outside the temple doors to beg for alms. And every day, people would pass by and they would see the man and, and they probably came to the point that they just didn't look at him anymore. He was just always there. But they would walk on by. And his disciples stop and they ask him, Master, who sinned? Who's to blame, this man or his parents? Because you see, in Jesus' day, it was commonly thought that bad things happened to bad people and good things happened to good people. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And Jesus tells them, it's not that the man has sinned or his parents, but rather his blindness will be used by God to reveal his glory. His blindness will reveal the glory of God. And then he does something really strange with spit. Now, you know, spit is real helpful, isn't it? Sometimes I use it as a solvent, you know, to wash things off or clean up my kids' mouths when I could do that. But he spits in the dirt, and he makes some mud, and he anoints the man's eyes, probably at great protest. And then he tells him, oh, go, wash your eyes. And, you know, this seems kind of like a cruel thing to tell a blind man. And maybe his disciples led him to the pool and he washed his eyes, and when he opened them, he said, I can see. I can see. I was blind, but I can see. And immediately what happened is people, they said, is this the same blind guy that was sitting by the temple gate begging? Oh, some said, oh yeah, I know him. This is the same man. And others said, oh no, it's got to be someone else. And so they took this man to the Pharisees, to the religious elite, to see if they might understand what had happened. They wanted to know how and where and who had performed this healing. Because obviously he was a sinner, he was a false prophet because he had healed the man on the Sabbath and the Jewish law prohibited anyone from working on the Sabbath. It's rather ironic that Jesus, the perfect son of God, is thought to be a sinner by those who were self-righteous. What Jesus is talking about is spiritual blindness. That only those 
who know that they are blind can be healed. And those who think they do not need healing will remain blind. And the truth is, we don't see clearly either. 2,000 years later, we still are able to fool ourselves, to deny those things in our lives that we believe to be true for us that everybody else can see. Oh, that's not so good. You see, we begin to build up all kinds of truths that we're special, we're different. This won't happen to me until it does. And that blindness towards what is not good in our lives suddenly becomes revealed in sometimes very tragic or spectacular ways. Jesus takes a man born blind and heals him to reveal the glory of God. Now think back to when you were children. For some of you, that might, well, I don't know if you'll remember that or not, but think back to the time you had children or grandchildren. And we all know that we have this uh, basic instinct to fear the dark, because you can't see in the dark. You don't know what's around you. And because we can't see, we begin to make up things. We begin to believe that there are boogeymen hiding in the closets and monsters under the bed. And we cry out and our parents come running in and they flip on the light. Where are the boogeyman? Where are the monsters? There are none, but because we couldn't see, we were afraid. Now sometimes when we're in the dark, things happen that we're not expecting. When I had to get up, you know, to the bathroom at night, and I've discovered that happens more often with age. I got an amen out there. (laughs) The bathroom, I would say my side of the bed was closest to the bathroom. It's only about 10 feet away. Uh, And I've made this trip many, many times in the dark. And on that night I got up and I'm and I'm walking toward the bathroom door when suddenly I trip over something, an object that should not have been there. And I found myself falling and I I literally hit the wall and there was a light switch there that uh, illuminated the dressing room outside the bathroom and, and I cried out. I won't tell you what I cried out. Let's let's just say that I cried out, help me, Jesus. (laughs) But when the light came on, I suddenly discovered what it was that was in the way. And you know, it is hard to see a black lab at night in a dark room. (laughs) If I had seen her, I would have probably stepped over her. And we've all had that experience of bumping into furniture or even stubbing our toe because we cannot see. We walk in darkness even though there is light for us to see. You see, the Pharisees thought they were good, that they were better off than everyone else, that they knew better but they were blind to the truth 
that their pride and their arrogance was the very thing that separated them from experiencing the love of God. And it, this is the good news. That even though we sin, God has a plan. But we have to come to that point that we realize that we sin, that we can't see while we're in the dark. It's only Jesus that makes the difference. It made the difference for the man who was born blind, and it makes the difference also for the Pharisees. For the man born blind comes to see, but those who said we have no sin remain in darkness. First John says, in him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The light of the Lamb is in the city of God. Shine in our hearts, Lord Jesus. When we think that what we do doesn't matter, you know, that uh, we're just following our own path, we deceive ourselves. And we've seen it through numerous cel celebrities and professional athletes and politicians and even preachers whose lives suddenly come crashing down around them because they were pursuing things that they saw as truth for them that were no truth. Only Jesus is that truth. And what we discover in him is that we have this great capacity for doing good or evil, for being compassionate or cruel and we can convince ourselves that everyone else is right we know better than they but it is only when we come to humble ourselves to realize our own pride that we need someone to rescue us that we begin to see the light of Christ that was always there but we kept our eyes shut. The confidence that we had in the dark is really no confidence at all. It is just a mere whistling in that darkness to give us a sense of false confidence. But when we humble ourselves, we come to the truth. And our blindness is taken away. Friends, there are all kinds of things that I'm blind to, that you're blind to, and you know what? I can see your faults a lot easier than I can see my own. You see, I really have no faults. <laughs> Just ask Letitia, she'll tell you. And, and that's true, not only of my faults, but also of my strengths. It's hard to see where you're strong, where you're gifted. But other people can see it. It is in our weakness that Christ lifts us up. There is this falling and this rising. There is this life, death, and resurrection pattern that we find is woven into all of our lives and our salvation ironically comes by acknowledging the truth. Those who refuse to come to the light remain in darkness. But those who are willing to come, to be anointed, to be obedient and go to the pool and wash, they will see. What choice will you make? Will you come to Jesus and receive the forgiveness that he literally is dying to give you? 
or will you refuse and remain in darkness? Will you bow your heads as we pray? Oh God, we thank you that you are the one who knows us better than we know ourselves, who sees all of our, fit, our faults, who is aware of the evil that we have done, the people that we have hurt, and how much we have hurt ourselves. Open our eyes that we may see and give glory to God for the great miracle of healing that you have to give. For we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning is our Join Sunday. We have persons here who have been attending for a while that perhaps you have a desire to come forward and to make this church your church home because we can't do this whole Christian faith thing by ourselves. We have to do it in community. And so, as we sing our closing hymn, you're invited to come forward. You can meet Mark and myself here at our altar rail, and we'll be glad to receive you into the life and the fellowship of this church. Please stand as we sing. <laughs>